welcome to Small Spark Theory. This podcast is designed as a collection of thoughts, ideas and practical tips on using marginal gains to help your agency new business endeavours. Small Spark Theory is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann of Gunpowder Consulting. Welcome back to Small Spark Theory. We've got a rather different episode for you today. Back in early May, we hosted a live recording with an invited audience in partnership with our friends at YCN. And here's the first of two episodes we recorded on that night. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. I'm so pleased to see you all here. Thanks for coming out on a Thursday evening, particularly as it's now a sunny Thursday evening, which we haven't had one of those for a while. Tonight, we're actually hosting this event in partnership with YCN. So I'm just going to hand over to Hannah Finley from YCN, who's going to tell you a little bit more about YCN. Hello, everybody. So, yeah, I'm Hannah. I'm from YCN. I'm Partnerships Director there. For those of you who aren't familiar with YCN at all, we are a creative network. We've been around since about 2001, and since then we've been building up a community of people who share a kind of passion for connecting and learning from one another. Our members today are brands, organisations, consultancies and agencies who have a kind of desire, I suppose, to learn, learn from one another, and also to grow and connect with other people in the industry. One of the things that we very much believe in is that the best learnings happen when you connect with people outside of your own organisation and kind of look outside of a box and have conversations with your peers. So that's very much in line with what we're doing tonight, which is lovely for us. Um, It felt like a very natural partnership as well because Lucy has been one of the specialists who leads our roundtables on new business strategy um, and agency growth, which is one of the most popular topics that we've explored with our members. And I just want to say a big thank you for partnering with us tonight because it's really exciting. We hold a whole load of um, events for our members so panels like this evening round tables and workshops for them to come along to and having specialists join in really kind of adds to the conversation and to the learnings that we're able to offer people and that's it from us thanks Hannah Um, we're going to get started I would love to first of all introduce Felix Velarde Felix joined us a year ago for I think it was episode four on planning for growth. And it was has been one of our most popular episodes. I can remember, this is when I was still recording this podcast at home. <laughs> and it was really, I think Heath Robinson is probably the best way to describe it. It was a little bit um, shambolic. But uh, we had a really interesting episode. And when I got the first edit back from our editor she sent me the file and she said well I just this is amazing she said who is this guy she said I've been repeating all of his advice to my husband she said, and I have to say if he was going to start a cult I think I would have to join it <laughs> so welcome back Felix and for those uh, who haven't uh, met you before or didn't listen to that episode please tell us a little bit about your experience and, and what it is you're doing now Uh, Thank you, Lucy. Hello. I, completely by accident, and because nobody would give me a job, largely because I had blue hair and an attitude, 24 years ago started one of the world's first web design companies and went on to be founder of a bunch of different agencies, some of which were really successful, some of which were really famous, and quite a lot of which I completely screwed up. So I've, I've probably made most mistakes that you can make running a business and in particular running agencies. But along the way I did six agency sales uh, I've done a lot of M&A and about three years ago I decided to give up. I decided I'd had had enough of running companies and then I found myself being asked to come and advise companies so I'm now a non-exec chairman 
of three agencies, an advertising company called Alpha Century, which is doing extremely well. They're brilliant. Uh, a digital agency called Impero, which is doing extremely well, and they're brilliant. And uh, a tech build company called Deason, which is doing extremely well, and they're brilliant. There's a theme here. There is. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> and I'm a board advisor to a private equity firm, and I've just joined the board of a virtual reality company that's doing a, a coin offering, crypto coin offering, in the next uh, couple of months that's based in Ukraine. So that's what I do now. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Our other guest today is Joanna Brassett from Studio Into. Now, I'm really conscious when we're recording these episodes that we're talking about a lot of theory and some of it's my theory and I'm talking to a lot of experts who are bringing their particular points of view. But I thought a year or so in, it was probably time for me to put my money where my mouth is, actually. And so I've invited Joanna along. Joanna and I have worked together now for five years. And Joanna has been implementing a lot of the techniques and advice that we talk about on the podcast. So I thought I would bring her here today so that she can talk to you about some of her experiences and you'd have an opportunity to ask her some questions. But first, Joanna, please do tell everybody a bit about your lovely business and your background. Okay, hello. So my background is in product design, in packaging design. That was my first um, part of my career, translating brand values into three-dimensional objects. Then I went on, I was very interested in consumer culture, consumer research, and I studied anthropology and sociology. So in at Studio Into and in my work, I combined these two worlds of, of the creative, of the design with social sciences and, and really put it into the context of business. I've worked as a, a senior design researcher at Seymour Powell and then after that I founded Studio Into. So that's now six years ago. Studio Into is my first and one business. You asked me if this was my first business. And Studio Into is a global innovation agency. We have global reach. We operate in this globalized context and we combine the the very deep local knowledge with global intelligence and we give our clients a new perspective. So we conduct research and, and strategize for, for our clients. We work with marketing teams, advising them how to localize their strategies. We work with the strategy teams and work on go-to-market strategies, for example, and also boost new, new product development. And we had to kind of operate at this global level we kind of small and big at the same time. So we have a core team of, of five members right now operating in London. And we have 80 experts spread globally across 65 countries. And they are on the ground in those countries working with us on global projects. So we have optimized our process for these multi-region projects and kind of have this knowledge at our fingertips for our clients. Great. But just just to be really clear, your core team mm -hmm. is five. That's right. So, so we, we are five. And I think what is interesting is that when we work with brands, we work actually with quite large, big brands that are very global, such as Uber and Skyscanner and Lego. And when we pitch and compete for projects, we compete with very large agencies. So we the smaller one against those very global agencies who have hundreds and, and you know, up to thousand members of teams across many, many different countries. Great. Thanks, Joanna. Felix, I'd just like to start with you and thinking about obviously starting your own business way back at the beginning and then selling a number of times and now in the advisory roles that you have now. You've experienced growth at all the different stages right from the beginning through to some of those other pain points and I wonder whether you could just talk about some of the the challenges at those different levels those different sizes. Well it's different depending on the type of company that you have I've had two or three companies that were first into market or in first one or two or three companies in their sector the challenge for those was a challenge of education was telling clients that they really needed this new thing. Web design in the first case is SEO, the second one, and ECRM was the third. And actually, that's, that's 
really about PR and drive and dogged determination because you can't really make a process out of trying to get people to understand that there's a new way of doing things. I think it's much different if you are in a well-established market. So I've, I've been through those periods and, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of person who's very happy to stand up and wave my arms around and tell people why they're, why they're doing it all wrong and it should be done a better way. And for better or worse, we've sort of managed to get away with it. I think when you're in an established market, once you've got past that education sort of hump, it then comes down to process. And, and the first time that really hit home was probably about 10 years ago. I'd had a bunch of agencies that for, largely because my creative partners have always been absolutely amazing and my entire job was to represent them, those agencies were, very, were famous and the phone kept going. So we didn't really have to do much other than pitch well. In about 2008, the phone stopped going for the first time in my career and that was scary. That was absolutely terrifying because suddenly I didn't know what to do. I knew I could pitch, I knew I could sell when somebody came to me, but I didn't know how to, to go and find new clients. And so we went through about a period of about 18 months of trying every single thing that is traditionally done to generate leads and new business. And every time something didn't work, we'd shut it down, we'd move on to the next thing. And eventually, thankfully, we found a formula that worked for us. It's a formula that I've now applied across something like 20 agencies that seems to work very well. And it's very similar thinking to the thinking that Lucy does at Gunpowder. And it, it turns out that actually it's about creating a process and doing things one little step at a time and grinding through and keeping on going. So I've, I've, I've sort of been there and the challenges really are how do you get that started? How do you not misstep? How do you avoid doing the things that we now know, in my case being old, don't work and therefore is just going to be a waste of time and how do you find the formula that's going to work for you largely it's about frameworks and processes and just being thorough and diligent thank you that brings me on to you joanna because i know um when we first started working together we we put together a plan but i'm quite interested to find out actually how you've managed to manage that plan with such a small team but really kind of realize that that growth and 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 see that new business success i wonder if you could talk about some of the things that have worked some things that haven't worked yeah so i think all throughout it's juggling a lot of plates at the same time and um being really fine-tuned and aware of what's happening around you so i think in the beginning we had a good year where we were working with lego and then it was a similar situation. We stopped having those phone calls from Lego. And it was a moment when we started w working with Lucy and it was a massive learning curve, particularly around cold outreach. We had a certain amount of, of kind of network, but together with Lucy, then we decided, yes, we need to focus. We need to, because it can feel, I think, very overwhelming where to start. And we started to focus on a particular industry, even though we can transfer the kind of processes on, on industries, but building on the knowledge and experience we had around the kids industry, we started to focus on that. We started to create a pool of knowledge that we then could share and offer to our cold contacts. I think there are many different approaches and it's very much a style one can take. And I think... Our style in the beginning was, was a very generous one. It was one to say, hey, we've got something. We know stuff. Let's talk. And from there on, you can, we started conversations with, with many different people. And I think an example from that then, then came, with, we're working now with Tom and Hippie, which is kids' products like bottles and nappy bins, for example. But getting there, getting into a project, I think took us two years. It's a really long, long process and you have to be patient and you have to know that this is a long game. It's worth it. There are many different touch points and you kind of have to pull together different aspects. 
it needs to be um, going to events and speaking at events, publishing things, contacting them at a very personal level. And all of this kind of one particular contact we had at Tom and Tippy eventually converted into a project. But it was actually because this particular woman we spoke to, she she changed jobs and actually we became relevant to her because she started a job as a head of the region in Asia and China specifically. And because of our reach into Chinese culture and consumer behavior, we became relevant to her. So all the time before that, we actually were not relevant. We didn't know that, but we kind of kept going, kept going, and then eventually we were relevant. I seem to remember there was a really lovely story about you doing a conference call. I don't know what, which client it was, but you were doing a conference call. It was like a, uh, a creds meeting over Skype. And you were talking about your your research that you'd done into the aging population. Mm-hmm. And they misunderstood that. Oh, yes. 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 That was wonderful. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. So probably a year later, we thought, OK, we had this kids industry outreach. Let's focus on another industry or another kind of knowledge pool we have. And this, and we did work around uh, the future of the aging population uh, with some universities. And we kind of pulled together that knowledge and started contacting people with that knowledge. So then we started to have these overlapping contacts. One where kids, one where these aging population type, you know, focused brands. And we had a phone call with um, Dorel, which is Maxi Cozy car seats. And we had this credential phone call. It was Skype over Skype. We're talking to them actually about the aging population because we were talking about how great grandparents are a future opportunity for these kids brands. And and Dorel then started saying, so you do work with Asian Asian population, and um, they thought you were saying Asian population. Yes, yes, we said yeah. yes. We, we do work with aging population, and he said you do work with Asian population. Oh, we've got a project with the age for the Asian population. Oh, like, of course we do work with Asian <laughs> Asian population. Of course we always did. Yes, so all the time. Of course, yeah. and then you know next day we had a brief for for China. <laughs> and that was, yeah. and it was our first project with yeah. the rail. Yeah, I think there was a bit of. If they hear this, they won't believe. There it. was a bit of kicking under the table going on. I seem to remember during that particular yes, Skype yes. call. Say nothing. Say, say nothing. nothing. We Just always keep, work with China. We keep always going. Work with China. Keep going. <laughs> One of the things that I'm conscious of, though, is that at the beginning of that process, the things that you were talking about, the speaking at events, the getting PR, the outreach, there was no external support for any of that? No, no nothing. So you were nothing doing at all. all of that yourself? Okay. And just remind me, because you gave me the stat earlier, mm. the percentage of your clients that have come through cold outreach versus through your network? Yeah, so we kind of looked at it just recently and looked at the six years of who we reached out to, which contacts converted into projects, which converted into proposals, and then which converted actually into projects and which were just conversations and um, it's about 70 percent of our projects are from cold outreach fantastic and 30 from warm contacts or from recommendations fantastic yeah, yeah that's um a lot of hard work gone in there definitely, definitely. Uh, great felix i'm wondering about how some of those challenges where you that certainly with some of the businesses that you're advising now because i often see actually on linkedin i notice that you're posting about the agencies that you're working with that are looking to hire in particular Mm. positions and quite often in sort of marketing and new business support positions and i'm wondering how because obviously as as an agency grows and fantastic it means that you've got more resource you've got more budget you can start hiring some people to do some of these things but that comes with its own challenges as well right yes uh, the the companies i work with typically grow three times profit in about 18 months so they're very fast growth companies which makes them a lot of fun yeah but the challenges that come with that are how do you manage that growth Typically, a small agency or a small company that you know you you're in the sort of the family stage, and you get beyond the family stage, and it becomes a sort of a a little 
club. And if you're not careful, then it becomes a cult. And you've got an inner circle and an outer circle. And that sort of happens at the 25 people mark. And then when you get up to 50 people, it then becomes a business and you're seriously starting to think about systems and stuff like that. And, and at that point, you're starting to think about HR. HR is absolutely strategic. Yeah. Finding the right people, hiring A players, has to be built in as early as possible. So once you get past that, the optimum team size seems to be, in, in agency land at least, uh, about 12. You grow in multiples of those 12, so you have a 12-person perfect size team, then you get to 15, it all starts becoming a bit woolly, and then you get to 25 and it all settles down again, so you go through these little steps. When you are growing, you're starting to create formulas for new business and for business growth. It's at that point that you start really needing to hire very, very good people. You'll start off when you're in your 12 people, five of you will be very senior, you'll be very top heavy and not very profitable. You get to 12 people and suddenly you're starting to make your 20% net margin. You get up to 25 people, and you're starting not to be able to manage the whole company with the original two or three people at the top. And you need to start then thinking about hiring serious talent. So there are, so there are some amazing processes. Uh, there's a great book by Jeff Smart called uh, Who? The A Method for Hiring, which gives you a formula and a manual for hiring superstars. And they're the kinds of people that you need to hire. People's difficult one, especially in new mm. business, because actually, as entrepreneurs, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for, I was an entrepreneur for 22 years. I now kind of attach myself to entrepreneurs, which is what a luxury. You are the one, you're the, it's your drive and your vision and so on, and your passion and enthusiasm that communicates to clients. That's why clients buy you in the early stages. That's why clients just, just oh, I want to work with that person. They've got such energy. When you get to 25 people and you're moving up to 50 people, you're not available to do that job of going out and hitting the road yourself and going and standing uh, up in front of events or doing road shows or training people or whatever it is. So you then actually have to find people who are competent. And what I mean by competent is people who are diligent, have a very strong work ethic, are capable of creating and following processes and seeing those processes through to the end and to be self-motivated. Ideally, you also want them to be able to manage up, manage their expectations properly and to reach their targets. And if you hire them, if you hire the right people, they will hit the targets because you'll have pre-qualified them. But especially in new business, you're looking for process people. You're not looking for people who look like you looked when you were the one driving the business. And too often I see entrepreneurs trying to hire superstar salespeople, people with loads of charisma and you know lots of chutzpah so they can go out and hit the road and so on absolutely the wrong kind of person they are not you a good salesperson will know when to wheel you on just to cement the deal or, or do that that uh, absolutely critical presentation but uh, marketing folk sales folk it's about process it's not about charisma yeah. or the vision that really only you owns it's a difficult one yeah yeah it's tricky you were mentioning it's the founder who is driving that new business in the beginning. What what I found is that actually my team is driving it together with me, mm -hmm. which, you know, in the beginning I thought the whole responsibility is on me, but actually it isn't. We have a creative strategist, we have an innovation lead, and they are driving it together with me and they can do that cold outreach as well. And they're getting the same success as me, which is yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And probably a lot of that is that energy. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I learned, sort of forcibly pointed out to me by somebody who's much more sensible than I was, um, <laughs> was, which seems to have been a recurrent theme in my career, is <laughs> just getting other people's common sense and recycling it. Uh, That's what this, this whole series is exactly that. So, yeah. Let's go with it. Let's go with it. <laughs> okay, we'll run with that. The reality is that as the boss and as the founder or the top team in your company, you can divide your time between all sorts of different things. The classic definition of managing director is toilets and phones. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever done an office move, it's toilets and broadband. It's the, the pain in the ass job. When you start growing, you start realizing that there are some things that only you can do and that there are some things that you can readily delegate. And identifying what you can delegate, toilets and phones being two, and delegating them 
will just free up more of your time so that you can spend your time doing the things that you are the best at. And whether that, that best at is creating the vision or going to meet prospects or dealing with your existing clients and growing those clients, whatever it is that you are best at, you should be spending as much of your time on that as possible. And anything that you can possibly delegate, you should be delegating. And the process of marketing, the process of lead generation, the process of sales, the processes of PR, and mind I'm saying processes, are things that you can delegate because they're just processes and there are an awful lot of people who are very, very good at taking a process and making it perfect and running with it. There are very few people who are good at standing up and creating a company and saying, sod it, I'm going to spend the next year completely broke, but I'm, I'm going to make it work by hook or by crook. You're those people. Delegate the rest. So I think that when you're hiring for marketing people and salespeople and the people who are going to take you out onto the road, you know, you, your team, I can see some of your team here, they're geniuses, they're brilliant researchers, they're brilliant anthropologists, they're brilliant brand architects and so on. That's what they should be spending their time on. Now, I appreciate it, at, at your sort of size, everybody's doing everything. This is you're in the family stage where you all muck in and everybody takes turns doing the washing up. By the time you get to 12, 25 people, that's when you need to hire specialists mm. who can take the stuff that frees you so you can be the brains of the operation or they can be the brains of the operation, whatever the, the balance is, so that you're spending the majority of your time doing the stuff that really you're the best person for that job. Everybody else you can really hire. My revelation on that came, somebody persuaded me to, as an experiment, hire a PA. And suddenly I realised that I was making twice the number of sales because I had twice the amount of time to go and talk to clients. I think because technology allows us to think, we've got all of these apps, you know, our laptops, our phones, email, calendars, everything is there. We think we can do it all. And we think, therefore, that we don't need that resource, mm. somebody to manage your calendar, somebody to, but it's not necessarily the case. And I think we, it's very easy to get caught up in that, well, I can do it because it's all, it's, you know, the technology allows me to do it, so I should be doing it myself. The danger is that we stop realising that a company is a company of people. Yeah. And we keep thinking in, I don't know if this is, is an acceptable way of putting it, there's a tendency or a temptation to want to say, well, in an age of flat hierarchies and we all should be doing everything because we all can do everything. The reality is that some people are better at some things than other people. Yes, as the boss, you should be making a coffee for everybody in the office when you're making a coffee for yourself. I mean, you know, once it gets beyond 12 people, maybe not. But no, you shouldn't be the one who's licking the envelopes to send invites out to a conference. You've got things that you would be more useful to the rest of the company if you were doing, to leave the stuff that can be delegated to other people. There are other people who want to learn, who want to see you in action. They won't see you in action if you're sitting by the, their side, helping them do their job. whether Joanna there are some particular pieces of advice that you would give uh, based on your kind of experience so far and the things that have worked really well the things that haven't worked so well what would be the the kind of three things that you would say these are absolutely what I would do I think one is keep it kind of multi-dimensional have different things happening at the same time such as Yes, your leadership thoughts, your cold outreach. At the same time, you have this other pool of people that you are kind of slightly warm, but you need to convert them into projects. And it's all happening at the same time. And you just never know which touch point will be the right one. And it's definitely a kind of always very much a long term play. Another one, it's I think it's it's confidence. It's the tone of voice one takes. And even the tone of voice you have in messages on LinkedIn, in your first conversations when they are face to face, it's a lot of that. When there's the right type of energy, you get the right return. What about LinkedIn? Because I know that you've been yeah. particularly 
active on LinkedIn and I know you've you've seen a really good return mm. from using LinkedIn. Is there any advice specifically around LinkedIn that you've felt has worked really well? I mean, on LinkedIn, what works really well for us in terms of kind of cold outreach is targeting the right type of people. So researching really well who would be the right contact and the higher up, the better. Because it, once you have a conversation with a higher position person, they advise somebody lower down to talk to us. So this type of process has happened many times to us. So talk to somebody, then they recommend that to somebody else yeah. Yeah, and then engaging them in, in conversations I think on LinkedIn once you are linked and you are in some kind of contact then it's when we see posts we kind of keep really track of people posting things on LinkedIn and having a little conversation saying you know giving comments to their posts they really notice us and they are just touch points just saying we're here and they are really opportunities to say we're here we're not selling at that particular moment we're not saying come on do you have a project now we've been waiting now for two years yeah. is it there in there yet you know yeah. um, it's just and and in that way people then respond better to emails and it's just you know it's all kind of like a machine that is just just going okay, okay. but then i think once we have those meetings we find actually face-to-face -face meetings work the best over kind of skype or zoom meetings i mean those type of meetings are okay once we have been recommended from somebody higher up yeah but the first touch point with a company really best face-to-face -face. it's yeah. worth to invest that energy and the travel yeah thank you felix some top tips mm -hmm. from you a business is pretty simple i think as I said right at the beginning, having made every single mistake, with 2020 hindsight, if only I'd known right from the beginning, then I wouldn't be here now. I'd be sitting on a beach somewhere. <laughs> um, I think two things. One is that there are very few things in business that are absolutely critical to get right. But hiring the right people, uh, having clear competitive differentiation, and having a plan, and good financial reporting, those are the fundamentals. When it comes to how do you grow fast, I, I'm kind of a growth hacking chairman, I guess. The companies that I, I work with all grow very fast. There's a very simple methodology to it. And, and well, I sort of hesitate to just say any plan is better than no plan. There is some fundamental truth in that. If you set yourself an ambitious goal in two years' time, uh, say triple your turnover or triple your profits, and then break that down, go to the end of that goal, say, okay, at that point in time, how many people are we? How did we get here? What kind of company are we? Then you can plot your path backwards to now. So you start at the end and you work backwards and you work out what things are missing at each stage. So every six months in this two year journey, what would be required in order to move you on a step? And that tends to break out a list of maybe 15 or 20 things that you probably need to do now. Sort out your competitive differentiation and then your website being one of those things, for example. Finding a good accountant might be another one. Reading uh, Jeff Smart's book on hiring. Reading The Four Obsessions by Patrick Lencioni and so on. There's a whole bunch of probably likely to be 15 things that you need to get on with now to have any chance of getting to your goal. I think if you break things down like that and then prioritise things, you can't do your website until you've done your competitive differentiation, got your messaging absolutely right. You can't hire a salesperson to take that sales message out until you've got the differentiation in your sales message and your website. So there's a certain order of things. And if you identify those 15 or 20 things that you need to do over the course of the next two years and then put them in raw, in order, then three or four, four of you in the top team can just do one of those things each a month or one of those things each a quarter. There's a thought experiment which is pretty basic, which says how hard would it be to double your turnover in two years? Most people think that doubling your turnover in a couple of years is really hard. But if you said how difficult would it be to increase your turnover by 3% in a month? It's much easier. Most people would be able to find a way. The compound interest says that 3% a month, every month for two years, will increase your turnover by 207%. 
So if you break things down into tiny little incremental steps, it's much, much easier to get to where you want to go. And that's all I do, and it's all the companies that I work with do, is we create a plan and a vision and a goal, and we break it down into tiny little steps that are very easy for the team and the people who work for us to make their way through. And then we probably deliver 70 or 80% of those 15 things in the first year. And guess what? We're pretty much on target for hitting our goal. So break things down into tiny little steps. There's too much of a tendency as entrepreneurs for us to try and take one big project and do it. We'll probably do four or five of those a year. If you break it down into 15 tiny little projects, you're more likely to do all of them. Brilliant. Thank you both. Sharman from Innovari Design. We're retail design consultants. I'm interested in Joanna's uh, LinkedIn time, actually, and how much you you manage to get done in a day. Do you have? Are you very strict with yourself? No, I'm I'm pretty fluid actually. I mean, I definitely check LinkedIn at least once a day, but probably many times a day, and I definitely try to put like you know a, a certain amount of time at a certain stage and you know maybe half an hour just a starting point but it really spins me out into so many different actions and um, spins me out on seeing some particular contact that I haven't been in touch with for a longer time and and then it goes from there or I can see other articles that I can recommend to somebody else and and so on anybody else just here. Um, this is a question for Felix. Um, I'm interested to understand how you go about finding the point of differentiation with the agencies that you work with. We're currently undergoing uh, quite a big structural change. We're part of the senior team, but the owners of the business are struggling to understand what makes us different. And we know we are, but I don't know where to begin or how to help them. Okay. At its simplest, it's just looking at the work that, that you have done that you really, really enjoy and want to do more of. And then... Competitive differentiation is, 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 broadly speaking, it's a statement of the stuff that you want to do and that your competitors don't say that they do. More or less all agencies do more or less all the same kind of thing, and most of us will do anything that a client asks. Um, <laughs> So I think it's absolutely congratulations on that one. Um, <laughs> uh, and we will all, you know, follow the money to some degree. But most people aren't very bold in what they say. I find too many agencies, and in fact, it's to my advantage or my company's advantage. Everybody is afraid of people coming to the website and, and going, oh, they don't do what we want. So most agencies say, we do anything. We'll do everything. The problem with you do everything is that you are up against whatever there are in, in this, this number of entrepreneurs, plus the other 33,000 agencies that there are in the UK, who all also will take any work and will say, we do everything. We're specialists in brand, art, creative and UX and tech and social media and blah, 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 blah. To stand out, you've got to be the one in the list where the client goes, I need an agency to do X. La, 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 la. We do X. Ah, they're the ones. So you've got to be ballsy. You've got to be able to have the confidence to stand up and say, do you know what? We just do X. The last agency that I ran that I sold twice and bought back twice, and I have no idea why, and then sold it for a final time, I think three years ago. We were an ECRM strategy company. And if you didn't want ECRM strategy... I mean, we could have done the work. I think we, along the way, secretly, we did 43 websites for British land four years ago, five years ago. We just didn't tell anybody about it. Our positioning was with the ECRM strategy agency and because we owned that positioning. We talked about it. We stood up events. We trained every, pretty much everybody who's in the CRM world, came through our training courses. We said we specialise. If you don't want this, don't come to us. But if you do want this, we're the only specialists. Everybody else is a generalist. Yeah, you could go to our competitor, but they also do UX and research and technology and blah, blah, blah. Do you want a specialist? Come to us. You've got to be brave. The ad agency that I chair, Alpha Century, their positioning is the creative agency for entrepreneurs. 
They only work for entrepreneurial brands. So if you're going down the long list of ad agencies you could work with and you're an entrepreneurial brand, you stop at Alpha Century because they specialize in what you do. And guess what? You have no competition. The digital agency that I work with, we make tired brands famous again. Yeah? If you're a tired brand, you stop at that one and you go and talk to them. They happen to be very good at making tired brands famous again. They didn't do anything particularly different, except they've become specialists in that and they can talk about it with authority. I think it's really, really important that you stand up for something because, yeah, you'll lose 99% of all the clients that are out there, but frankly, you're going to lose them anyway. At least you'll get that one client who wants what you do. What was the thing that you said in the last uh, episode, Felix? Or I think it was stand for something and repeat it incessantly. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I really like you that. Just, you just have to bang the same drum, yeah. be consistent. Yeah. One of the great things, though, is just a tiny little anecdote about Alpha Century, is when, they, when we went through the brand definition exercise, which we did together about, I don't know, 18 months ago, when I first started working for them, it's the first thing that we always attack is get your differentiation right. Now we've got a flag. Now we can plan around how to build that. One of the reasons that we found that positioning was they had done lots of on entrepreneurial brands and innovative brands. But lots of their staff, had, were the sorts of designers who had an Etsy shop on the side or were selling stuff on eBay or had come from a little startup themselves or had ambitions to have their own companies. So actually the people inside the company were entrepreneurial already. The second we started to say the creative agency for entrepreneurs, we started getting applicants for jobs who were entrepreneurial because they wanted to work for an entrepreneurial creative agency that would facilitate their ambitions. And their so guess what? Every single person around a table when a client comes in knows what it is to be an entrepreneur. So our positioning is now pretty much unimpeachable. In order for somebody else to muscle in on our territory, they'd have to fire half of their staff and hire a new bunch of entrepreneurial staff. It's a barrier to entry. So it's quite a nice moat around our own positioning in, in that particular case. It's self-reinforcing. You say you're good at it, you win clients because of it, you become better at it, and then you're better at it than the next person who's a generalist because they're flipping from job to job to job. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions anywhere? Hi there, I'm Neil from Nutbots. My question to you is, you know, relatively small company, but you're winning big clients. Do you position yourself as a larger agency than you actually are? And does it matter? Or do you have enough of a portfolio now to say, it doesn't matter that I've got five people working for me, I can take on people with 50? That's a really good question. <laughs> that's a really good question because that's something I experience all the time. Yeah, I, I think we had many conversations about that, how we position that. And I think we tried many different ways to go, how we're messaging that. But I think at first, when we start contacting people, we say we're large. It sounds as if we're very large. We have 80 people across 65 countries. And that sounds kind of like, OK, I haven't heard about that. And then after that, you know, it doesn't really matter to people if we are 50 or 5 or 80 or whatever. In that particular moment is then really being authentic and, and they understand then how we work on a very kind of curating and allocating our, our teams and that we can have this very global reach, but we have this very specialized core team. And it's not a problem whatsoever once we have that, that, that first meeting. I have a couple of thoughts on that because it's, it's a challenge that I come up against quite a lot when I'm talking to agencies. And I think there is a tendency with, with quite small agencies to feel a little bit defensive about that. And certainly um, that can come across on agency websites and there's a, a feeling that they don't really want to show people because they don't want to expose how many or few people there are. And I actually think that's a really big mistake because if you strip away the people, you're stripping away the heart of the business, that the clients are buying or prospects are buying people. So if you keep it really anonymous and just show the work, it, that you're only showing one dimension. And I, I also think that... You know, when I first started doing agency new business, it was back in the 90s, it was for advertising agencies, it was pre-digital, and it was 
really different. You know, big agencies carried a lot of weight. You know, uh, marketing directors could think easily think of the top five agencies that they would put together on a shortlist. One of the brilliant things about this whole digital disruption that we are experiencing is that clients are now much more used to dealing with specialists because there are so many different areas of technology and and marketing has just kind of exploded so, and because clients are more used to working with lots of specialists they know that those specialists are quite often small teams so i think there's a little bit of a shift and that smaller agencies don't need to feel quite so defensive about the size no absolutely we we just had a meeting <clears throat> last week with um, a furniture manufacturer and there was the same same conversations our contact showed us a list of 50, 60 competitors to us that he's considering to work with. There was in our meeting, he showed us a slide with <laughs> yeah, 50 and he's evaluating who to work with and, and we're one of those. <laughs> and he, he called it five, 12 different buckets of 12 different specialisms that we could <clears throat> be specializing in. And he wants to know two or three that we specialize in. And he says, those large agencies just cut our C space and, you know, it's up. They say they can do all of them, but can they? And they probably can, but none of them is really potentially excellent. Or And then working with a small one, then yes, he kind of had, it felt to me he was believing then that a small specialized agency will be really good at one of them. And that's what he wants. Yeah. Felix? I'm not sure. I I think in the very early days, I probably bullshitted as much as anybody else who starts up an agency for the very first time. And I think I fairly quickly realised that it didn't matter particularly because people were buying us as people and our ability to be nice to work with, to not screw it up, to not waste money and so on. I think now my view on it is that most clients have a preset set of criteria for the kinds of companies that they, they are going to be prepared to work with. So you will have a multinational who wants a multidiscipline service. They will have to go to a network. They're not going to come to you. But if they want bespoke research in South London, they might go to a bespoke research company in South London. And if it's specialised enough, then that can be one person with a team of freelancers or it could be it's whoever's most suitable for the job. Most clients don't want to be anywhere near your smallest client because they know that they'll get attention from the juniorest people. A lot of companies also have a, another set of defining characters or qualifications, which are we don't want to be your biggest client because if we account for 40% of your revenue and we pull our business, you're going to fall over. Most clients don't want to be in that position. So, so most clients want to be somewhere in the sort of top third of your clients, but not right at the top and not right at the bottom of that top third. So in theory, you shouldn't really be going for clients that you have no experience and no capacity to handle. You shouldn't be going for jobs that are a million pound jobs if you're a 200,000 pound agency. And most clients won't give you that work anyway. So it's a waste of time for both of you if you try. So as long as you are honest about the size of your clients and transparent and honest about what you want and as long as you're talking to clients that haven't disqualified you for scale reasons or for specialism reasons then you should be able to sync up so i don't i, I don't think there's ever any excuse for massaging the numbers or bullshitting or lying under any circumstances in, in businesses relationship you're building they're going to know the truth pretty instantly if they do hire you and you don't want to be fired so when, on the very rare occasions it is relevant, be straight. Because if it's a problem for them, they're not going to hire you anyway. Any more questions before? Oh yes, Harry, go for it. Hi, um, Harry from The Feature Factory. Felix, I'm going to touch on two points that you made. One was about charisma and one was about delegation. I'll try and link the two. Obviously, you've got great success in growing businesses. That doesn't happen without great sales, great new business. And, you know, my belief is that you do need a certain amount of charisma to be good at sales. That being said, I've seen it time and time again where agencies press a panic button 
they want growth, they want growth now, we need new business, I need more pitches, all this kind of stuff. So they go out and try and find a sales function, whether that be internally or externally. And often the thing that they, I see that they forget, and I wanted to kind of get your point of view on, was the lack of support that they then offer that service or person or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I wondered how that kind of plays to the delegation mm -hmm. point that you made, you know, where it's very easy for an MD to go, let's have a sales function and let's appoint these guys or appoint this mm -hmm. person. And then they go, that's going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. It's not always just the answer. So Not at all. Just to go back to earlier in your first point, the, the um, that panic button happens because sales have slowed down or there aren't any sales. I mean, we hit the panning button in 2008 because it was a recession, but because suddenly the phone stopped ringing, it was like, oh, Christ, what do we do? So when you're doing it in that reactive way, you are panicking. And it's much, much better to plan ahead. But it's a perfect illustration of the, the danger of having charismatic salesperson as the leader of a company, because when they're distracted, they're not able to sell. When they've had a run of successes and now they're having to bed in the clients and they're, they're not able to sell. So you get this sort of feast and famine in these waves which, which become kind of pilot-induced oscillation and, in my experience, uh, uh, are the cause of many agency crashes or, you know, sort of panic sales. So planning ahead is absolutely critical. And planning ahead also means working out what resources are required at what level. So there is probably... 80% of the hard groundwork, the sort of the, the machine bit of the, the leader sales job can be delegated to an external agency managed well by an internal resource, for example. And, and I have to say, and forgive me, I'm not a great fan of externalizing lead generation because I think you should own it. But, that, you know, so um, <laughs> that said, Future Factory are really nice. <laughs> 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 both, both Future Factory and Red Setter, who are both in the house, are both exceptional. I'm ah, just going to add that in. Perfect. <laughs> I can give you some top tips of who not to work with. But uh, um, Anyway, the point is that you've got to look at it as a machine. You still have to be the ones who've got to grease the machine and point the machine in the right direction. By analogy, I was always pretty good at PR. When I started my first few agencies, it all became famous very quickly. Because I loved doing PR, I was quite, you know, I found it quite fun, you know, it was a good distraction from real work. <laughs> and then I decided that somebody pointed out that if I spent less time on PR and more time on sales, we'd make more money. And so I sort of kowtowed and, and hired a PR agency. And the PR agency was one of those PR agencies that turned up with a little black book. And they said, we know all the journalists. And then they... they they used up their little black book fairly quickly and then suddenly stopped being productive. And so I ran a pitch for a bunch of uh, uh, PR agencies and I had 10 agencies come and, and see me. One of them came and see me uh, and said, well, we don't know anybody because we've never worked in your industry, but we have a process. And our process is we do X, Y, and Z, but you've got to feed us with material. You've got to feed us with content. Now, this is before content marketing was a thing. So this is in the... I don't know, 2000, 2001, something like that. And what I discovered was that they were brilliant at running the machine of getting content out there and into the right places, provided somebody gave them the damn content. So instead of me spending a third of my time writing content and building relationships and going schmoozing journalists and just standing up at events and so on, I'd spend 5% of my time writing content. I'd sit down three or four days a week for an hour and write another article. I'd throw it over the shoulder to the PR agency. They'd take it and run with it. And every now and again, we got some feedback and we'd spin it up into a nice big story and what have you. But it was a machine. I still had to participate in that machine. And it's exactly the same with a new business agency or new business person or salespeople, whatever it is. Whatever your new business function machine is, you have to feed the machine. Because otherwise... Our friends here at Future Factory will be going out and saying, yeah, they do everything that everybody else does. Please, will you have a meeting? Which will get you a few meetings. We won't get you any business because you'll be up against however many you are, uh, uh, there are of you in the room. 
They need a story. They need the competitive differentiation. They need to understand what your passion is, what you're going to be able to support, what the truth of your capabilities are, who your people are. And then they're going to ask, come to you constantly asking for feedback and asking for materials and asking for your input and asking for your hard work. You're delegating a large part of the work to them to run the machine, but you've still got to feed it. So to your, your question, without feeding suppliers like you, we've got nothing. In the same way, without clients giving us feedback on the work that we have been asked to do for them, we can't deliver. Don't forget that when you work with agencies like Future Factory and the others, they're doing your job, they're just doing it for you. Thank you, Felix. If you could just give Felix and Joanna a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening and to our fantastic audience and guests. We'll be back with part two of Small Spark Theory Live coming soon. You have been listening to Small Spark Theory, brought to you by Gunpowder Consulting. Join in the conversation on Twitter at Gunpowder Tweets, hashtag Small Spark Theory. The podcast is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann. Our editor is Claire Aban, and our producer is Isabel Jarvis. Music is provided by Duke Deck, available at dukedeck.com. For more information and to download further episodes, head to our blog at gunpowderconsulting.com. And if you like what you hear, head to iTunes and leave us a star. Mm-hmm.